Hi and welcome back to the Open Tech Lab. So this video is the second part of a series where I've been experimenting with the media processor inside a LKV373, which is a media extender device for sending HDMI video across a network. And in my previous video, I used this for uh, capturing HDMI imagery and sending it into my PC. And I'm interested in finding out if we can hack on this device because it's not perfect. Uh, one of the main issues it has is that it spams the network with multicast packets, which causes all the phones attached to the Wi-Fi to run out of battery power rather quickly. So it'd be interesting if we can change it and find out if it's got any hidden features. So I'm interested in finding out more about the device to find out how the existing firmware works and maybe even it will provide an opportunity to write a firmware of our own. So let's have a quick recap about what's going on on this board. So there are two processors on the board, U2 and MU1. And U2 is a media encoder processor. It is an ITE 9919 or something from that family. It's hard to tell because the labels have been removed. Uh, they're non-standard labels on both chips. But this chip's job appears to be to capture the HDMI signal through the input port and encode it into H.264, which is then sent through to the other processor. And it appears to have the job of bundling these up in Ethernet packets, which are sent out on the network. Now we've got complete control over the firmware that's loaded into this processor, or we should do anyway, because if we change the contents of the flash chip that was in this little position here, it gets reloaded from a backup somewhere on this board. And the only place where a backup of the firmware image could be stored is on this other little flash chip attached to the other processor on this side. So one thing that would be interesting to try is just to modify the rig so that we can control this flash chip also, so that when the backup is loaded, we've also rewritten the backup in addition, so that we're reloading a modified backup over the top of the modified firmware, and in fact we get the firmware loaded onto this chip that we want. Now why am I so interested in this media processor out of the two? Well, it's because on this little pin header here, there is this serial pin attached to it. So we can attach a serial port and see the spew coming out of uh, this chip. And presumably there's something similar on this other media processor over on this side. But for whatever reason, I can't find a pin that's attached to it on this board as, as anywhere I look. So I don't know how we can see the spew off this one. Otherwise, I would be happy to switch focus onto this chip instead. So we can try modifying the contents of this flash chip. The other thing we can try to do is look at the SPI bus that links these two chips together. So the command and control between the two media processors seems to be done through an SPI bus through which messages are sent between the two chips. And the question is, uh, could we read out those messages and get an indication of what's going on? So that would be another route. But to begin with, I think we're gonna need a bigger rig which has uh, a pad board attached to both sides. Now I don't mind saying it is a little bit frustrating that the first rig didn't yield the results I was hoping for. It's not the end of the world building a second one. I've just got a bit more soldering to do. Now, as I mentioned, for this project, I'm using heat stakes to attach the boards to the frames instead of nuts and bolts. And I'm finding they're working out really well. All you have to do is 3D print a little column that goes through the holes and protrudes through the top. And then you use a heated piece of metal to press down on them and melt the plastic over and rivet it in place. Then if you want to remove the boards, you can just clip them away with side cutters and very gently move them over to the new rig. So I'm glad that bit's out of the way. That was the really delicate part and I managed to move the two boards into the new rig without breaking anything. So the next step is to get the other flash chip moved off onto the other pad board. So I'm assembling this using my favored prototyping technique which involves pad board, mod wire and surface mount resistors. And I find it pretty easy to assemble boards this way using tweezers. It's not quite as slick as having custom boards prepared, which is very quick and easy to do, but it is a bit better in terms of making ad hoc modifications to the design as you go. So looking at the assembled result, I'm reasonably happy with how the wiring has turned out. Looking at the high level, I'm pretty pleased with it, but close up, it would be nicer if I could get the wire lengths a little bit more even, but the density is quite good, which is good to have when doing things at high speed. Right, so here you can see I've got the assembled rig, everything's in place up and running. I've got the two flash chips off on the pad boards. I've got two blue pills for reprogramming these things. Once again I've got the serial port over here 
And I've also added this logic analyzer, a DS logic logic analyzer, which is wired up to this pin header, which I've wired through to the SPI link. Uh, so with the logic analyzer, we can spy on communication between the two chips. Then in addition, I've also added this wire here, which connects through to this blue pill. And this wire goes through to the reset line. Uh, it triggers the reset switch. So I've got a modified version of the firmware in this blue pill board, and there's a command I can send to it that will trigger a hardware reset. Then finally, I've added a little USB power meter so I can keep an eye on the current being drawn by all the devices on my USB hub. So the end result of all this is that my device is now basically under complete remote control of my PC, and I can run any kind of test I want to do with it remotely. I don't have to do anything or touch anything on the physical device. Instead, I've written a whole suite of Python modules and command line tools that I can use to make it do whatever I need it to do. So a few weeks have passed since my last update and I've been doing a whole bunch of tests and experiments with it and as you might imagine things didn't exactly pan out the way I was expecting but nonetheless I discovered one or two rather interesting things. So the first thing I wanted to test was whether I could rewrite U2's firmware again and as you remember I tried to change some of the strings in it to see if I could get them to come out the serial port and it didn't work because MU1 came along with a backup of the firmware and rewrote it before the replaced firmware could execute. And I managed to find the backup in MU1's flash chip. And so I tried rewriting both the main flash chip for U2 and the backup attached to MU1 to keep them both in sync. And as it turns out, if you do that, it simply ends up in a reboot loop where MU1 is perpetually trying to correct the firmware uh, in U2's flash memory uh, with a version that is corrupted. And so it just doesn't start up. It just gets stuck trying to repair itself forever. So at this point, it was becoming pretty clear that the firmware in these flash chips was being protected by some kind of checksum. So next up, I wanted to know a bit more about which bytes were really important for the device to start up successfully and which ones could be changed with no effect. And in so doing, I was hoping to reveal which bytes were covered by the checksum. So I wrote a little test script that takes my backup firmware image of U2's flash chip and it goes through and inverts just a single byte, loads it into the flash chip in the device and then starts the device up by resetting it and captures the output on the serial port. And as the test ran, it would start the device up repeatedly with just a single byte modified every time. And in so doing, it would go through slowly revealing a picture of which bytes could be modified freely and which ones seem to have some impact on the device's behavior. So I left it running for about 24 hours until the test run was complete. And then I wrote some Python code to tabulate the results in HTML, which is what you see here. So every single cell in this table represents one byte of the firmware. And what it's showing is the output on the serial port when that byte was inverted by the Python script. Now, all the white cells are cells where there was no output from the device when the uh, device was started up. And then as we go down uh, through here, the different colors represent uh, different forms of outputs. Uh, so what it's done is it's captured the first 32 lines that the serial port uh, output, and then it's computed a hash uh, to produce the color. And what I found is that uh, even though these are uh, a few different colors, they are basically only two different categories. The gray ones and these green ones and uh, so on are all basically the device starting up as normal. Uh, then there are a couple of examples, outliers, where the device crashed during startup and decided to dump out the register state, uh, which itself is also very interesting. So with all this, uh, we can see different examples of the different bytes. Some of them seem to be relevant for whatever reason and some of them do not. And now as we scroll down, uh, we go all the way through uh, the header, uh, which has a mixture of important and unimportant bytes until we get to the SMAS section down the bottom here, uh, at which point every single byte uh, in the body of the SMAS section seems to be important. So looking at the results in this table, it's kind of interesting to see which bytes seem to be important. But the problem with this test run is that it hasn't really gone very far towards dispelling any of the mystery because although it shows us which bytes were important for the device to run properly, it doesn't really tell us anything about why they're important. It doesn't tell us what the role of each of these bytes is. So maybe this will come in handy uh, when some more information is known, 
but for now I'd say the test wasn't especially fruitful. But on the other hand, it was very easy to set up. It didn't take long to write the Python script and it's nice to be able to get the rig to do something automatic and leave it running for a while and see what it comes back with. And that's the thing about hacking around with these things. You've just got to try things and you never really know what's going to come out of doing one experiment or another. Now I had a real breakthrough when I started doing some analysis of some of the upgrade files for the Lane Kang device. So linked on Dan Man's blog is a link to a Google Drive folder run by someone called Daniel Kachera. And he has managed to collect together a bunch of upgrade files uh, for the Lane Kang device. I don't know where he got them from, but I started comparing them to see how they compared to each other. And I managed to find two files which were very, very closely related to each other. They were released within a few months. Uh, the top one came from 2016 February and the bottom one was released in uh, November 2016. So very, very close together. And these two files are very, very closely matching. They have very few differences. So the first couple of megabytes uh, of this file, these two files, is exactly the same. And it's only when we get to this point, a couple of megabytes in, uh, we get to the S media tag, which of course is what we get written. This is, would be the first bytes that go into our flash. And thereafter, there is a little bit of difference. You can see uh, the copyright, the release date, slightly different between the two. But everything else in the header before the SMAS section is exactly the same until we get down to the SMAS. And then you can see the two words before it are slightly different. So this, this word here, uh, between here and here, is very slightly different. And I think this is a strong indication that this number is the uncompressed length of the data. Uh, very, very close, uh, these two numbers together, uh, because of course there's very little difference between these two firmware files. And then this here, I think, is our checksum. It looks too much like a checksum to not be one as far as I'm concerned. 32-bit uh, value. Now, I've been trying to figure out what this is a checksum uh, of, how it was calculated, doing a bunch of different things and even brute forcing it. And I haven't been able to figure out how this thing's been calculated just yet. Uh, but you can see that these two firmwares are very similar. And it's as we scroll down, there are only one or two tiny little differences in the early part of the SMAS data. Uh, it's, it continues to be the same, the same, the same until we get uh, beyond a certain point and then the two seem to radically diverge from each other. So now I'm getting quite excited about this. I think we might be beginning to get somewhere and I definitely think we should keep on digging. But that's about it for this video. So I'm Joel Holdsworth. If you enjoyed the content, give it a like and subscribe. Or if you want to support the channel, I've moved my donations over to Subscribestar and you'll find links to that down below along with the show notes containing lots of background information for this video. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.